Crescent Village on the east coast of Massachusetts is located on a sailor's chart at 42 degrees 15 minutes north latitude and 70 degrees 49 minutes west longitude. In the early part of the 19th century, in the first half of the 20th century, most folks here would aptly describe Cohasset as a very active and vibrant fishing port. The major part of the maritime industry here was the catching of mackerel during the early and mid-1800s. Mm -hmm. uh, the mackerel fishing industry declined when it would decline after the Civil War, and it was gone for most of these small ports, small towns, uh, somewhat before 1900, about a century, a little more than a century ago. Mm -hmm. Ships were built here at the harbor, small as the harbor is, some fairly large ones. An 800-ton, three-masted, full-rigged ship was built here. Uh, but Cohasset, with its very small harbor, uh, could not support any kind of mercantile trade or large vessels, transatlantic vessels and so forth. They all had to go to Boston. So the fishing fleets that were here in the mid-1800s were largely owned by local families, mm -hmm. uh, usually skippered by a local skipper. Sometimes the crews were from here and sometimes they were from elsewhere. Uh, they could be a mix of uh, American, Canadian, and Portuguese, for instance. This is a story about four Cohasset sea-loving men. Two fishermen, Herb and Ken Jason, brothers, were born in the village over 80 years ago, currently still yielding to the call of the sea. It is believed that Herb's 70 years as a lobsterman might just own a record in that sea career. Herb's brother, Ken, has achieved the respect of his community, applying his trade, aside from fishing, but also as a worthy craftsman. 150 years earlier, the other two men, Joseph Antone and Joseph Wilson, worked offshore of Cohasset as assistant keepers of the light. Their workstation was atop a new lighthouse, completed in 1850. It stood three miles out on one of the most treacherous ledges along the East Coast. The need for the light became obvious as records revealed over 40 shipwrecks at the ledge in the previous decade. The first tower out here was designed by an engineer who worked with the Army Corps of Engineers. His name was William Swift. He was appointed to begin the process of constructing the first lighthouse here at Minot's Ledge under the direction of Stephen Pleasanton, who was the fifth auditor of the U.S. Treasury at that time. The fifth auditor had dominion and jurisdiction over all lighthouses here in the continental U.S. The first tower out here was constructed in such a fashion that the base of the tower was only 25 feet wide, when it should have been 45 feet wide. As a result of having a narrow base, the first tower at Minot's Ledge swayed two feet either way and really proved to be quite a precarious station to be stationed upon. The first two keepers out here were Isaac Dunham and Isaac Dunham Jr., both having been in, uh, experienced lighthouse keepers at previous stations uh, elsewhere in the United States. But because of their fear of the instability of the first tower and the fact that it swayed with even the slightest swell out here, they resigned after 10 months. They'd, have, they'd also had, had endured a couple of rather treacherous storms uh, that really, literally scared them to death. So they resigned from the position. And a gentleman by the name of John Bennett, who had previously served with the Royal Navy, was assigned as head keeper after having moved here to the United States. He and Joseph Anton and Joseph Wilson were the first uh, assistants after uh, Dunham uh, resigned his position. Well, the problem with uh, constructing a tower of this type was that under Pleasanton's administration with the U.S. Treasury, they were more conscious of costs than they were about the actual construction of the first tower. Their, uh, the object of uh, Stephen Pleasanton's office was to spend as little as possible and do as much as possible with every dollar that they had. If he could return money back to the Treasury after the uh, completion of a lighthouse station, 
he felt that he had been something of a success, when in actuality, every dollar that was assigned to the project, every penny of every dollar every, in the budget that was set aside for the construction should have been spent to the maximum to ensure the safety, the stability, and the structural integrity of such a tower out here. Uh, and, and we do have some background material uh, pertaining to the designer, the architect of the light, Captain Swift, uh, and some of his thoughts and his fears about the light, even before it, it, it started, even before it was first lit. There was concern about the structure of the building of the tower uh, as to how strong it really was. Uh, and there was some doubt in the mind of the architect uh, as to how long, how long it might last and how well it would stand up to the winter storms here. Uh, presumably there wasn't a lot he could have done about it. It was an assignment, government assignment, for, uh, from the Corps of Engineers. He had a certain size of a ledge to work with, he had a certain amount of money that had been appropriated, and that was the light that resulted. Soon after the lighthouse was in operation, the keeper, Isaac Dunham, filed a complaint that the lighthouse structure in foul weather was unsafe because it rocked two feet back and forth like a drunken sailor. His concern was ignored, which prompted him immediately to resign. In October 1850, a replacement, John Bennett, signed on, receiving a yearly salary of $1,000. Bennett's two assistants, Joseph Wilson and Joseph Anton, remained receiving a salary of $550 a year. Six months later, Bennett traveled to Boston seeking a replacement for their shuttle boat, which was damaged in an April nor'easter. Antone and Wilson were charged by Bennett to keep the light burning. note in a bottle found by a fisherman the following day clearly defined the horrendous plight Anton and Wilson faced that fearful night of April the 16th. It stated the tower would not stand through the night. It was swaying two feet each way. Anton's body was found on Nantasket Beach the following day, but it wasn't until October that Bennett discovered the remains of Wilson on Gull Ledge. I kept thinking about it a lot of times, like in the winter time, especially in the winter time, and coming in at night in the winter from fishing, lobster fishing, and, and going by the lighthouse out there. Uh, there was a constant reminder for you. Huh? Yeah, you know, I was, I'd look up at that lighthouse and say, must have been a terrible, a terrible night, you know, swaying back and forth two feet each side of center. And finally, that's for three days, and three or four days and nights swaying in and finally it went over and they, they were drowned. And, uh... Remembrances of Antone and Wilson didn't go away easily for her. In fact, they built into a force that he was unable to suppress. Continued trips by the lighthouse during his many years of lobstering left a void in his heart. Herb Jason was determined to follow his impulses he had to do something to honor the two heroes. Cohasset 50 years ago was, uh, there wasn't so many that, uh, I think negative people that, uh, today, uh, 
if you want to do something, there's always those that will be against you. But in the 50s, you more or less could, uh, if you wanted to build something or do something, you could do it without a lot of controversy. That's one of the things that, uh, uh, that I, I see the difference is. I find today that uh, there's uh, so many committees, and I find that the committees uh, are not knowledgeable in what they're supposed to represent. And if a citizen, a private citizen, wants to do something, uh, you have to buck these committees, and, uh, and you don't always make out that uh, that's the way it is. In the early 50s, it was very simple. There were three selectmen, and they pretty much ran the town as, as, as they wished, and people who elected them trusted them and let them uh, manage the affairs of the, of the town. But as time went on, people in Cohasset, the more, um, uh, maybe more sophisticated or better educated people began to demand more from town government and to compare uh, the way funds were spent, for example, um, in Cohasset with what was going on in other towns. So they began to put more of a, a professional cast on things. And um, as more people moved into Cohasset, there was a greater de demand, a greater problem with water shortages and sewage disposal, uh, flooding, and, and so forth, so that um, you had to have more committees looking into these problems and coming up with solutions. In uh, 1939, I won the state heavyweight boxing championship with a, a gentleman that night, his name was John Sullivan, and he's the one that got murdered by the Mafia in Boston, and he also won night. We, we both won the state championship that night. Another gentleman by the name of Coronas, and I don't, I don't remember the others. 1946, I won the New England Amateur Championship. Did you and that was the height of my boxing. Uh, why'd you give it up? I was getting older, and I wasn't going anywhere. It was beginning to hurt? No, it didn't bother me any. <laughs> we, we now have a, a town manager who is the, um, the focus, and I think that um, as long as there's someone in charge, you, d you don't have too many groups going off on their own. They're not really... In little independent fiefdoms as, as they might have been in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, my feeling is that Cohasset is actually running very, very smoothly now. I mean, there, there are controversies and different points of view, but that's healthy. And um, I, I feel that things are actually running very well. Herb Jason, knowing the years were passing too quickly, felt he had to act on his 70-year-old dream of building a memorial to Anton and Wilson. He reached out and welcomed his grandson's help to finally make it happen. John Small was anxious and ready to fully support his grandfather's dream. The partnership then charted a course, determined to sail full throttle, avoiding all hazards. A project committee of four was formed, including the leadership of Wigmore Pearson, whose talents, they felt, would result in a promising and successful conclusion. Also coming aboard with 10 other supporters was Chief Warrant Officer David Waldrip of Boston's 1st Coast Guard District, also making a 49-foot Coast Guard buoy boat available. We sat down and sat making drawings, my brother Kenny and Johnny and I, and uh, what are we going to have, before we do anything, let's, let's get a plan of what we're going to do. And uh, we thought of all kinds of things, plaques, uh, uh, granite uh, stones, uh, but we didn't, we didn't have anything that was real nautical enough until one day I was out in the boat and uh, I was wondering about it. And, I looked down at, the, at my compass, and there's a compass card. It was a, it was a it was
was a compass rose. And I said, well, that's it. That's the thing that, uh, that's the thing that I want to, that's to be the good basis for the bottom of the, of the memorial. So that's how the, uh, and then it was in keeping with uh, Cohasset's nautical past. As you know, this harbor was uh, the focal part of the Cohasset. This is, was Cohasset, this harbor was. We wanted something that reflect Cohasset's nautical past. And I, I think that does it. Initially, there was a split by the town committees for Herb's ambitious design. But a previous accomplishment by this talented innovator, that is his designing and building a copper dome for the replica of Minded Light, may have swayed reluctant officials to sign on. Today we're breaking ground for the memorial to uh, Joseph Antone and Joseph Wilson. On the left is Captain Herb Jason. On the right is uh, our good friend Ken Jason, brothers, longtime citizens of Cohasset. And what we're doing is we're celebrating the groundbreaking of this wonderful memorial on Government Island, Cohasset, on this day, July 15, 1999. Congratulations, uh, Herb and Ken. I think this is a great memorial, and I think the town is going to benefit from this, and everybody that comes to Government Island will understand the piece of history that they're going to be observing here. So good luck, and I hope it's a successful project. Thank you very much, Mike. My pleasure. Well, I think it's great that this is happening finally. Herb and Ken have worked a lot of years trying to get the money raised, and I think it's a great opportunity for the town. I really think it'll be something great for the Government Island area, and thank Herb and Kenny quite a bit for their thank work. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I'd just like to echo the sentiments expressed by Merle. I wish my good buddies the best of luck, and I supported them in their project, and I'm looking forward to a completion. Thank you, Dan. Congratulations. This project is about a hundred and something years overdue. 150. And I'm glad it's finally beginning and good luck to you. Thank you, man. Man. Very sweet. Thank you both for all your efforts. <clears throat> yes, I uh, did start the sailing club in 1960, but one of the most important things, and perhaps you have already said it, is that that lighthouse was built by Herb Jason and helpers who worked with him. He, he made that copper on the top, which is an unbelievable thing, and I don't know how he's kept it shiny ever since it was made. But he did a terrific, no, really, copper turns green when it isn't taken care of. And he did a good job. He's still doing a good job. And this is one that is well overdue because those kids used to walk around this town and they were lost on that lighthouse out there in, I think, 1851? That's correct. That's, that's, that's the I'm a good guesser. <laughs> and now we turn to the, the man behind this project who's been working on it and been thinking about it all of his lifetime, a man who has made his living from the sea as a lobsterman in Cohasset beginning when you were about 15 years old, Herb. Is that correct? And now Herb's 85, almost 86. And we wanted to uh, make something out of it, so we figured the best thing to do would make it in the form of a compass rose. And we've used the very best granite we could find them. The stones come from uh, Canada. Uh, the main stone, the black granite, comes from uh, India. That's the, <clears throat> the best uh, black granite there is. It's expensive, but we figured that the boys were worth it. On the back of the stone, of the black granite, there's going to be a picture of the lighthouse that's tumbling into the, not tumbling, being swept away into the ocean. It's a beautiful picture. You've seen it. 
Herb, congratulations. Best of luck. And uh, we thank you for this, for this project and this idea. And I'm sure that the town of Cohasset and citizens and those who visit our town will enjoy looking at this memorial for, ma for many, many decades to come. Thanks. A great boost and encouraging start for the Memorial Committee emerged when the Hingham Institution for Savings agreed to host the fund. Also given a generous startup donation of $1,000. The endorsement gave impetus to the committee, soon resulting in strong local financial support, allowing the project to rapidly move forward. Has this project been totally funded yet, John? Uh, no, we've got uh, roughly maybe 20,000, maybe a little bit less, more to go. Uh -huh. 20,000 and the total project might be, did I hear correctly, uh, about $50,000? Yeah, 50, maybe just a slight bit over. And how do you feel? What are the prospects for getting the rest of the money? Uh, I think we uh, have pretty decent prospects. I think now that we've got the stone down here and uh, we're coming along. I think that uh, a lot of times people like to see a little progress made before they make a donation. And uh, hopefully, now that they, you know, this is going on here, and they'll see this, uh, you know, we'll uh, do a little better in the donation department. We have to get the word out. That's it. Right. Exactly. There's a lot of work in this. this. The black stone, the jet black, comes from India, and the Barry Gray comes from Barry, Vermont. And we had all this cut up in Barry. And the points of the compass, the, the four points, four points of Canadian pink, pink color, and the other four points are jet black from India. And these are all... The points of the compass going in today? Not today. The uh, bricklayer will do all them, and he's already put the patent down how it's going to be, and he has the template that we use to cut out the points of the compass. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, this whole thing weighs over 5,500 pounds.